Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. You are tuning in to the first of our five part speaker series that is a part of our Dirty South exhibition on view at the Virginia Museum of Fine Art. My name is Izzy Fuqua. I'm the adult programs coordinator. And I've had the delight of working with Valerie Cassell Oliver, the curator of the exhibition to work on this series. Tonight, you'll be hearing from three speakers uh, and Valerie will moderate that panel. They'll speak for approximately 45 minutes and then we'll take questions from you, the audience. Okay, with that, Alex, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank, thank you, uh, Izzy. And, and I wanna say thank you to Izzy. We all should because she does an enormous amount of work uh, behind the scenes and then preparing for all of this. So thanks, Izzy, for getting stuff and running and then watching to make sure we're gonna run well through this. Uh, and welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we have a very distinguished uh, trio uh, of professors who are joining us. Uh, but of course, the, the real star is our own Valerie Castle Oliver. If you have not seen this exhibition, The Dirty South, let me just uh, prepare you. Uh, be prepared. Be prepared for an experience that's visual. Uh, be prepared for an experience that's going to fill your senses with sound, uh, with light. There are more than 140 works of art in this exhibition. And this is a, an, an important exhibition, not just because of the sensory overload you will experience uh, and will need to come back time and time again, but this is a, a landmark exhibition. The a landmark exhibition from a scholarly standpoint. And because of that, uh, it will, in fact, it will travel. It will travel to Crystal Bridges in Arkansas, to the Contemporary Art Museum, uh, where Valerie had come from in Houston, uh, the Contemporary Art Museum in Chicago. So we're thrilled to be able to send this out on the road. It's an important show, important because it helps to establish and, and make very clear this hundred year plus record, uh, the last hundred years, of the impact of African-American visual art and music on not just the worlds of art and music, but on the world we live in, on all of America. And it shows you how important these artists, some self-taught, some uh, who went to Yale and to other uh, academic uh, bastions, but it does it in a way that's approachable, is absolutely fascinating and captivating uh, and, and quite frankly, it's hard, hard to leave. So I encourage you to come and I encourage you to come several times uh, to enjoy this exhibition. Uh, there also is going to be an exhibition catalog that you can take uh, as not just a souvenir, but fabulous essays, because uh, this is a scholarly work as well. It's something, and I wanna say thanks to Dr. Michael Taylor, our deputy director and chief curator. Every one of our curators, each of the departments is working on major exhibitions that produce something important to their respective fields that also travel and produce books that become important in the fields that they represent. Um, this exhibition has been put together as by our star, our superstar curator. I can't provide enough superlatives about Valerie. Uh, Valerie's been with us for four years, 17 years before, uh, at, prior to this at the Houston Contemporary Art Museum uh, where she starred as well. Um, she has now finished her third book in those four years for the museum. She did the Howard Mint, Dean and Pindell exhibition, co-curated that uh, with Chicago's uh, Contemporary Museum, and then also did the beautiful Souls Going Deep catalog that we had about a year and a half ago, and then this volume as well. Uh, she is brilliant as a scholar, but her real talent shines through when you see this exhibition, being able to conceive of something so complex and so enormous in terms of its weight and its breadth and its volume, but do it in a way that we can all enjoy it, we can absorb it, uh, and we can be stimulated and excited by it to want to learn and know more. And it's a subject that we are committed to. Uh, at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, if you look at our strategic plan, which is online on our website, uh, or our previous strategic plan, you know, our commitment to the issues of diversity, particularly around African-American art. And, you know, sadly, Virginia was the place in English North America where the first enslaved Africans came to English North America in 1619. 
but what they brought with them in terms of literary prowess and legacy, music, visual arts, uh, has permeated our visual and auditory world for more than 400 years. And this 100-year swath that Valerie has provided for us is absolutely fascinating. Uh, we have one of the most talented curators of contemporary art, not just in this country, but quite frankly, anywhere in the world. And Valerie has brought to us uh, an amazing exhibition. So we hope that you enjoy it. Come frequently, uh, come soon uh, and enjoy this exhibition. It's my pleasure to introduce our host, Valerie Castle Oliver, the Lewis Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art. Valerie, thank you. Thank you, Alex. It, it, um, it's always beautiful to receive those, uh, that beautiful bouquet that you give me each and every time you introduce. And um, I am just so uh, honored to be here to do the work. And um, I'm thankful for your leadership and uh, for really opening the doors wide to explore contemporary art in all of its complexity. And uh, certainly this exhibition would not happen uh, without um, your leadership and without the leadership of the governance of this institution. And uh, certainly in concert with our wonderful Dr. Michael Taylor, uh, who leads the charge among the curators every day. So really grateful and to all the men and women who have worked behind the scenes to manifest this vision um, that I had. Uh, I just um, honor them and I honor their work and really delighted to um, bring into focus some of the aspects of this uh, project. Um, this is the first of a number of virtual speaker series that we are conducting. And uh, tonight is very special. So I'm, I'm delighted to uh, invite uh, our three guests uh, to join me on screen. I will um, just do a very brief introduction, literally their titles. Um, they're very uh, renowned in their own fields of study and where they contribute most and where they endeavor. Um, but we have parts of the South. We have Duke University, Rice University and our own U of R right here represented. Um, and just very briefly, again, by way of titles and uh, just a project that they're working on, um, I will introduce them and, um, and then we'll launch into our conversation. Um, first, and I'm not sure if the order is the same on my screen as it will be on the screens of our audiences. So as I mention your name, just sort of, you know, nod, do whatever you can do. But, um, Mark Anthony Neal uh, is the uh, James B. Duke Professor of African and African American Studies and Professor of English and Chair of the Department of African and African American Studies at Duke University. Um, he is a prolific author and um, what I'm very excited about is this very this forthcoming book, uh, which is Black Ephemera, Challenge and the Crisis of the Archive. Um, he has done a number of um, courses at Duke and I think uh, directs the Center for Arts, Digital Culture and Entrepreneurship, um, which is now uh, looking at a video broadcast called Left of Black now in its 10th season. So lots and lots to explore. And again, just please uh, audience members do endeavor uh, in uh, researching more of, of our guests. Uh, next is Anthony B. Penn, uh, who is the Agnes Cullen Arnold Professor of Humanities and a professor of religion at Rice University. Um, many dubious titles, not dubious, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> I love this, uh, your South African title is the, can you say that for me? Ex Professor Extraordinaris. Yes, at the University of South Africa, which is really wonderful. Uh, in fact, I, when I met Tony, I had started working on this project. So it was just, um, it's been a long friendship. So I only say that in jest, uh, wonderful and prolific author. We were just talking about writing and Tony has written over 35 books uh, which are framing religion and, um, and uh, humanist studies and, uh, and a number of uh, 
of uh, activities uh, around the art and religion. And in fact, there is a forthcoming book called The Interplay of Things, um, Religion, Art, and the Presence Together. Um, and just to follow up, Tony is also um, the director, the founding director of the Center of Engaged Research and Collaborative Learning and is the inaugural director of the Center of African and African American Studies, which are both located at Rice University. Um, last but not least is Eric Nielsen, who is professor of liberal arts at the University of Richmond. And uh, he has uh, consulted on a number of um, cases, um, which all have gone to, the, some of which have gone to the Supreme Court. Uh, and he has authored three amicus briefs uh, for the Supreme Court, uh, which was dealing with rap lyrics and um, criminal activity, I believe. Um, you may know him from a wonderful book, uh, which was published in 2019 called Rap on Trial, which he co-authored with Andrea Dennis. Uh, he is also the co-author of The Hip Hop and Obama Reader, uh, which was printed and, um, in 2015. So with that, I hope I did you gentlemen justice uh, in just the brief intro. And uh, we'll launch directly into um, our conversation. And the reason why you're here just for those uh, tuning in is because I was, very, um, I was very taken by this idea of Southern hip hop entering into the academy. And all of you have worked um, collaboratively with uh, icons of Southern hip hop. Tony, you've worked with Bambi at Rice University. Uh, Eric, you've worked with Mad Skills at the University of Richmond. Uh, and um, Mark Anthony, you've worked with Ninth Wonder there at Duke University. So I first wanna ask, you know, what was the impetus? What was the catalyst of bringing um, this sort of collaborative venture, bringing hip hop into the academy, and then uh, the, how the collaborations really came into being. So um, I'll just randomly start. Uh, let's start with Eric. That, folks, that wasn't random. Uh, <laughs> she told me that that was coming to me first. Um, and well, I think my introduction order was appropriate. I'm not sure this was, but it's all good. Um, I. The, the, the catalyst or the impetus. Well, I had been teaching courses on rap music and hip hop culture at the University of Richmond from sort of the day I arrived. But, you know, I was very aware of um, what professors Neil and Penn were doing. I mean, everybody was. I mean, I knew that ninth one, that I, I don't know how many times you all have taught that course, but you're on several iterations by now. And I knew Bun B. Um, had been working with you. And so I really wanted to work with an artist myself, but it, I wanted it to be an artist who was, who could help me connect the courses that I was teaching to the community I was teaching within. So, and, and, and I will say that Richmond, you know, doesn't have a huge hip hop scene. Um, Virginia has an interesting hip hop scene, but I, I really wasn't willing, I, I was looking for the right person. Otherwise I would just keep doing it myself until I could get there. And so uh, at, at one point I was supervising a student and she was doing a project for me related to, to rap music. And she said, you know, I think it would be really valuable for me to go and interview um, Shaquan Lewis, Mad Skills. And, and she said, you know, if I do that, would you like to join? And I, of course, knew who he was. I was aware of, you know, his, his, uh, his album, uh, The Nod Factor. Um, but no, it was from where? The Nod Factor was a, the, the single off of it. In any case, I said, yeah, absolutely. So we met at, uh, in the library, the very basement of the library at the University of Richmond. And when I got there, I was prepared for calls from him or her saying he's lost because it's very difficult to find him. And he was there before both of us. And, and I thought, how did you understand this? And he said, wait, no, I know this campus. I've been here a bunch. And if you're not from Richmond, you will know that the University of Richmond is not, it's not VCU. It's not in the middle of the city. It's, you know, where there, it, it, it actually, it's almost kind of gated out of the, you know, it's half of it isn't even within the city. Um, and so I was just surprised. And what he revealed to me was that, um, Years before, he actually got his start 
at the University of Richmond. He had a friend who was a student there. He wasn't a student there. And his friend had a radio show on the University of Richmond radio. Um, and so his friend said, hey, look, if you come and do X, Y, Z for me, I'll let you rap at the very end of the show. And so he started rapping at the end of the show. And, and so I'm just sitting there thinking, wait a minute, is, is this serious? Uh, because University of Richmond's kind of buttoned down, at least in its reputation. And, and he said, not only that, but some caller came in and said, you know, who is that guy on the, on the mic? He's got mad skills. And all of a sudden, that's where his name came from. So from there, we were just talking forever. And it was very clear to me that for a lot of reasons, um, he would be the perfect person to teach with. We started talking a bunch over the subsequent months, maybe over a year. And that's kind of how it became what it was. And so we've taught a class just a couple of times, but we're planning to teach it again in the spring. So that's our, that's our story. When, when did your classes start? When did your, when did that collaboration start? I want to say it was spring of 18. So it was spring of 18 that we taught our first one. And then we taught one, I guess it was right when COVID hit. So I think that would have been spring of, I guess, 20. Mm -hmm. um, if that sounds right, it's COVID, you know, the time, I'm not sure, but that's when it was. And we plan on teaching it again um, in the, in, in the upcoming spring. Okay. And Tony, do you want to discuss? Certainly, certainly. So in a, in a very real way, I had no choice but to do it. And, and by that, I mean, there was something about hip hop that had influenced and informed my mood, my posture towards the world. It was a part of who I am. All right, so I, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, and Mark knows Buffalo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I grew up between Delaware Park and Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. Park, the public pool. Mark, know, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and part of the safeguard for me was church. And, and there were benefits to being in the church and there were drawbacks. Um, and, and so, for example, the, the church taught me to value myself, but it did that at the expense of my body, right? What was most important to me was constrained and confined by this body from which I had to ultimately be freed. And, and that troubled me some, and it was hip hop that taught me to think about how I occupy time and space differently, right? To value this embodiment. And I took this with me. It was a part of who I was as a student. It informed and influenced my dissertation. And once I got the job, I knew I could not leave this behind. So when I got to Minnesota McAllister College, almost 30 years ago now, it was part of what I taught. It wasn't always a separate course but it influenced and informed what I taught. For me, it was important because it was a cultural touchstone for my students, right? It gave them a way to visualize, understand, and probe some of the major questions of my subfield and to do it in a way that tied them, their history to this subfield. So I did this in, in Minnesota, it was part of my teaching. And then when I got to Houston, it was a different world that was opened up to me, yeah. right? I could do this thing for real. And, and so I, I had this course on religion and hip hop culture. And we started bringing artists through. And it was a slow process, right? Because they had no reason to trust me. It wasn't as if Rice had really spent any time developing <laughs> a relationship right. with certain segments of the city. Now, Valerie knows what I mean. They, they were comfortable with River Oaks. They were comfortable with Memorial, Southampton, the Third Ward, Fifth Ward. South Park. <laughs> what? Not. So these artists were initially like, look, you know, dude, you know, no disrespect, but I don't, I don't know you. <laughs> right? I don't know you. Right. You're not from here, and I don't know you. So it took time and persistence. And one of my graduate students, um, Andrea Matthews was interning at Rep a Lot Records and she just kept, she was persistent about it. My professor really wants folks to come through. We're not playing, we mean business, right? No disrespect, we appreciate, we're fans, we wanna bring you through. And so artists started coming through mm -hmm. and we would ask them to do guest lectures because I understood that I could study it, I could listen to it, 
but they had a relationship to it that I could not provide my students. And I would be doing my students a disservice to be in Houston and not give them an opportunity to understand this culture from the vantage point of folks who were producing it. Mm -hmm. And so they're coming through. And then I asked about Bun B. And we had a couple of phone conversations. And initially he's like, no, I don't, you know, I don't know about this. You know, I, I we talked and we talked and finally he agreed, okay, I'll come through. And we had some time to talk in my office before his lecture. And the conversation, I mean, I was just blown away by his brilliance. You know, I knew that artists were gifted on a variety of levels. And this conversation with Bond convinced me I would be doing myself, I'd be doing him, I would be doing the students a disservice if we did not figure out a way to get him involved beyond a guest lecture. So I asked him if he'd be willing to co-teach the course with me. And, and he reluctantly said yes. And so we started mapping this out and working together and it was just a radically different experience for us and for the students, right? And in the classroom, I, I need to learn something as well. And, and having Bun in the classroom with me, I was learning so much. And again, I was providing, we were providing these students with a touchstone, a cultural touchstone, something that kind of grounded this attention to religion and the kind of themes and concerns that are embedded in the study of religion. Mm -hmm. and, and so we, we continued to teach it. We've taught it a good number of times now. And we've reached a point where we need to re-envision it, mm -hmm. that we need to rethink it. And, and it began in earnest when? When did you begin teaching with Bun B? Do you remember what year that was? Oh, geez. It was, I, I want to say, about nine years ago. OK, OK. And, and so now it's a matter of figuring out other ways for Bun to be involved at Rice, right? Yeah. That, that his, his, his influence and his capacity extends beyond this one class. And so we got to figure out, now we're trying to figure out other ways to get him involved that continue to impact what we can do here. Yeah. And, and, and also think about it in ways that force Rice to wrestle with what it understands and what it means when it says it's public facing. Yes. Absolutely. Great. And now Mark. So, you know, like, like Tony, I'm a bit of a, a, an old head, you know, so my first tenure track position was at Xavier University in New Orleans, right? HBCU. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was a culture shock, right? Because I'm the hip hop head that grew up in the Bronx, right? Who, who had a serious East Coast bias. And suddenly I'm down here you know, in New Orleans, <laughs> and, 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 and the kids are pushing me to listen to the music differently. You know, I introduced hip hop into my classes that year at Xavier, in, in part because of street cred, right? Wanting to build some sort of connection, you know, with students at an HBCU. Um, it wasn't really until I got to the University of Albany um, that I finally taught, you know, a, a quote unquote hip hop class mm -hmm. through an English department. And, and I remember, you know, because my, you know, my interaction with hip hop is as much about the sonic as it is the lyrical, right? I would say it, for me, it's more that it's always the sonic that brings me in. That in many ways for me, the lyrics are secondary. So I'm teaching this English course on, on you know, hip hop and, and students are pushing back, right? Because this, this isn't an English course, <laughs> right? What, what does this have to do with the field of English, right? Or, or literature. And it, and it was important to me because despite some of the pushback, I had standing room only in this class, which reminded me, this is 2002, right? That, that there's a need and a want, mm -hmm. right? For intellectually engaging what was happening in the world. Uh, I got brought to Duke in 2004 in part because that's what I did, right? Taught hip hop. Um, the first iteration, first edition of That's the Joint Hip Hop Studies Reader was published just as I got to Duke. Um, and so I had, you know, freedom and free reign. And I happened to be invited to do a radio show, local, P uh, local NPR, WNC, 
Um, and it, because hip hop was something to talk about, they paired me with uh, this producer, Ninth Wonder. And, you know, as soon as I got to Duke, folks were telling me, it's like, you know, you got to listen to North Carolina hip hop, you got to listen to Lil Brother, listen to Lil Brother, right? All right. And, and then, of course, I hear him on the Black Album. Right, which which comes out in two thousand four, and so we're sitting there in the studio, right? And, and I'm not much of a fanboy. Um, I, I typically actually try not to engage with artists in that way, but we had like this fifteen minute conversation before we went on air about being girl dads, um, about being girl dads, and the fact that our favorite hip hop song was Pete Rock and C.L. Smooth's They Reminisce Over You, right? So whether that we taught together or not, we were gonna be fast friends <laughs> after that. And, and Ninth was teaching a course uh, with uh, Play from Kid and Play um, mm -hmm. at North Carolina Central. And, and the leadership at North Carolina Central at the time did not appreciate hip hop and Ninth Wonder being attached to their brand. <laughs> um, so the, the kind of funding structure that they had, they let it go. Uh, mm -hmm. And when that happened, I was like, come over to Duke. <laughs> and, and so we did our first class in the fall of 2010 and we've done together 10 iterations of the history of hip hop. It started out as Sampling Soul. Um, and we did it as that iteration for three years and, also, and at some point realized we had aged out to the point that we now were getting students who knew very little about hip hop history, right? So we had to double down on the history of hip hop and, and hence we changed the name of the course. Um, this past semester, the first semester that did not co-teach it with Ninth. He co-taught it with my colleague, uh, Joseph Winters, uh, who does stuff with hip hop and religion. And, and I think part of the, the pressure for that was that, you know, I'm 55. Um, Ninth at 47 is almost an old head <laughs> in talking about it this way. He's 47? Uh, yeah, Ninth one is 47. He does right? not look 47, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and, and so, you know, bringing Joe into the class, bring a kind of youth movement right, to how we were engaging with students in the work. The thing that we always wanted to make clear is that we weren't gonna spend 15 weeks talking about the South was better than the East or East Coast, West Coast, or whether or not your team Nas or, or teams Jay-Z. I'm team Jay-Z, by the way. Um, but we, we wanted to use hip hop as a portal, really to talk about race and American life and black American life in the post-World War II era, uh, era, right? So we always started the course with Baraka's blues people, right? And if you don't have a foundational understanding of how black music functions in the world, anything else we're gonna talk about with hip hop isn't gonna matter. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I love the fact that you brought in the, the construct of the portal because that's exactly what happens with the Dirty South. Mm -hmm. Hip-hop serves as a portal onto understanding deeper traditions, sort of aesthetic, spirituality. Uh, it is really looking at how um, hip-hop preserves and celebrates these right. elements of, of Southern culture. So uh, I'm, it's, it's wonderful to hear this sort of impetus. I'm, I'm curious now as to um, now that this is established at your various universities, sort of what impact it's been having uh, and where you've seen um, the affects of, of the presence on that campus and uh, on the academics. So um, Tony, I'll start with you. Yeah, just a, a few things on that. One, it has increased the ways in which students move between disciplines and so this course has drawn students from across the university, right? And not just undergraduates, but students from the business school, architecture, want to take this. Again, it's a touchstone that brings them all into this orbit. It is also required Rice to rethink in a much more significant way who is authorized to speak. Right, and how we frame and understand that authorization. Because one of the things, when I, when I told my dean and told the provost that we were, my center was making Bonn um, the distinguished lecturer, and that I wasn't asking, this was, we were going to do, gonna do it. <laughs> really a heads up. Yeah. The president Googled Bonn. <laughs> right, and you, come on now. <laughs> 
And so under the surface, there were questions, right? But my thing was, we don't ask those questions about any of the guests who come to the Baker Institute yes. or the business school, right? right? Yep. So we're not going to entertain those questions now. Right. We're going to understand that Bun is a complex individual who is culturally and socially, politically significant. We're going to understand him as more than one dimensional. Right. Right, so it, forced, it has forced folks on, on the campus, particularly senior administrators, to kind of rethink how they engage. Again, it's also forced Rice to rethink what it means to be public facing. For, so for example, almost everything that takes place on campus is free and open to the public, but the geography of the school doesn't support that. Right, unless you know where you are and where you're going, it's an intimidating environment. By design. <laughs> By design. Yes, that's actually that's you gotta get there. Right. And so and, and so our effort to bring Houston on campus forced a reevaluation of what Rice did versus what it said. Right? A kind of reevaluation of its public identity. To rethink its audience. And, and finally, it forced Rice to rethink the significance, the importance of discomfort, mm. right? With the uncomfortable about hip hop, but don't shut down. This is an opportunity for conversation and reevaluation. Right, got it. And Eric? I was gonna say, I, I really, it, it, I wish I had had a chance to speak to both of you before this, just to understand your experiences, because of course I was watching what you were doing and I was trying to emulate it. Um, just because I saw the value uh, for the reasons that you said, uh, Professor Penn, um, you know, in bringing in actual practitioners into the space because of all the ways that your students can learn, but that you can learn. Mm -hmm. but. I also, Professor Neil spoke to it. Um, it's it. You worry that there. Are, you both did about institutional resistance, and so you know it, what I had to do. You know, once I was convinced that we could do this, once I had a person that could come in and do this, I was already convinced about his genius. I was already convinced about the art form and how it was definitely worthy of academic inquiry. For me, those were questions that were answered, you know, a couple of decades before, to be frank. You know, thanks in part to these guys. And also, you know, Trisha Rose's book, you know, everybody, you know, all the things that helped me start to understand that, hey, we can do this academically. So I, when I, when I approached skills, I said, and it's funny, we're having similar conversations. I'm like, would you like to teach with me? He's like, uh, I'm skeptical. Then he starts reaching out to all of his friends, right? And he's saying, you know, is this sound normal? Does this sound real? Is this possible? Because he doesn't trust me, and nor should he. We don't know each other. We just live in the same place. And in order to get there, I already anticipated anti institutional resistance. I didn't get it the way that I thought that I would, but I said to him, hey, help me make this something that administrators can't say no to. Help me get some stuff. So I got letters, I got, so I said, help me get some recommendations. I got a recommendation from a Virginia State delegate. I got uh, recommendations from multiple academics. I got a recommendation letter from Ninth Wonder himself. And, <laughs> and my favorite, was this, if you can see it, that's a handwritten recommendation from Chuck D. <laughs> and yes, and, what, and essentially my, my sense was, I'm not sure how everybody's gonna receive this, but I'm guessing there's gonna be skepticism and I wanna create a situation where that skepticism becomes a problem for you. Um, and, and so that's what we did. Um, that doesn't really answer the question of like what the imprint has been, but I will say that once we got it done and once it came and taught, we did an event together um, on the University of Richmond campus. It was Hank Shockley from the Bomb Squad and uh, Skills was there. We I was there. We had a law professor there. You know, as soon as we, it was free, and in fact, I insisted that we reserve 50% of the seats for people who were not students or faculty at the university. 
sold sold out again. It was free, but was over registered immediately. Um, but and then we had a two hundred person waiting list. We the police showed up and said, "Do we have anything to worry about?" It wasn't actually about they were worried about a rapper coming because if you've met Hank Shockley, especially that's not the violence is not your worry. Um, he's he's a total. I mean, he's a genius, but that's not it. It was more that this has generated so much interest that we're worried that people will get upset if they are turned away. So we did it and it was wonderful. It, this was the imprint that we had, not just at our university, which brought together different departments and different schools, but we had Hank Shockley. We had a law professor who was turned out to be a hip hop head. I had no idea. I just brought him, I just brought him in because he knew about sampling. That was the topic. And by the end, you watched this moment break down a whole lot of stereotypes. You watched a lot of white people look at Hank Shockley and be like, oh my God, <laughs> like he's the smartest person I've probably ever met. And you saw a lot of black folks in the audience looking at this law professor who you would not expect mm -hmm. to know anything, mm -hmm. talking mm -hmm. about his dedication to vinyl and how he grew up coming up like this. And on the way out, and this is the end of my story, we had one person talk to my dean and, and he said to her, this is the first time I've ever been on a college campus. Not, this is the first time I, I've never come on a college campus before. And so the University of Richmond as this place that's so separate and different, that, is, that speaks to what teaching hip hop can, can do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And, and Mark, would you like to add to our um, story? You know, Duke sits geographically similar to the ways that Rice is related to Houston and Richmond is related to Richmond. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Ninth Wonder is, is a unicorn in the sense that he's a Black man born and raised in North Carolina who's a Duke fan first, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a whole, a whole lot of, right? you either, you know, State <laughs> or, or UNC or, or HBCUs, right? You know, a and Central, what have you. Um, and, and so the fact that he has been this unicorn has very been very helpful, right? Because, you know, I've, I've essentially had to be his PR uh, person on campus, right? To get the campus to understand the weight and the gravity of what hip hop is and certain figures are out in the world, right? Because universities don't think that way, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the critical things that were important, right, to, to remind the university, right, particularly the communications folks, well, how many Grammy Award winners do you actually have walking around this campus? <laughs> Let's just start with that question, right? <laughs> right, <laughs> right, and, and it, it turned out there was like two, right, but only one of them was in the classroom teaching, right? So so just, just start with that conversation, right? Uh, Ninth also happened to be one of the first uh, Nasir Jones fellows at Harvard. Um, you know, he did it back in 2012. And that's a big, I mean, he made a documentary, right, about being at Harvard and teaching at Duke for a year. Um, and, you know, so he has, you know, Henry Louis Gates on his phone. And, and we had given, you know, Skip an honorary award um, and all the black faculty were invited. Uh, Patrick wasn't, uh, Patrick is, is his real name. Um, and Skip got to the event and was like, I don't see Patrick and, and hit him up on the cell phone. <laughs> and, and Patrick walks in, right? And all the folks are like going, who's this? And Skip's like, well, this is my friend Patrick, right? So it's, so it's like those kinds of moments, right? And then it didn't help that, you know, he's also a big basketball head. So he and Kay are tight. Right, so there's a whole region of the university that gets introduced to him and his work and his label, right? You know, so you have you know Rhapsody who was on who's on uh, on their label, you know, doing musical drops for the basketball team, right? You know, so it, it's those kinds of things. But ultimately, it was about what we do in the classroom, right? So, you know, the class meets once a week in the evening, right? And in the evening part is is important for a couple of reasons. Um, we wanted the class to be open. Right, and, and trying to explain that to the registrar, you know, to the point that we just stop trying to explain it and just tell people, right? Because we were like, it's open to the public. They are like, well, where do I register? No, just come. We wanted to make sure it was a classroom space, right? It holds 180 folks, right? Where folks could come in, right? Because we were sensitive to the fact that Duke was essentially poaching ninth from an HBCU, <laughs> right? It was also important to encourage students from Central from UNC, right? Half of our TAs typically are coming from UNC, right? But they're also coming from Duke Law School, 
right? And they're also coming from Duke Divinity, right? And to Anthony's point, you know, we, because it's taught in the spring semester, we had all these engineering and computer science students who were graduating, right? Who had a semester to take classes who ended up in the class, right? So it became this kind of rarefied space in that context. And we decided about five years in that we were gonna live stream one of the sessions. Uh, it was on the anniversary of Nas's Illmatic. Um, we did an hour long live stream. There were 10,000 individual views during that hour time that we were on, including the one kid, right, who sent me an email the next day and was like, I was on the fence about whether or not I was coming to Duke. Then I sat and watched this and I decided, right. And so that's the note that you got to make sure you send to the provost and the vice provost. Yes, you know, and the marketing people. Right, yes. to understand, like, y'all need to understand, y'all need to come to us to figure out what's happening here, right. Well, it, it, it speaks to validating a sort of voice of a whole generation. I mean, that's what I think about and what you're all doing in your own ways are uh, allowing the academy to begin to bend um, toward a new generation and validating uh, uh, forms of expression that are fairly new. Sometimes it has to work its way up to being validated with the weight of history behind it. But there's a validity that I think is being offered. And the fact that you're bringing in the authentic voices, it's not like you're teaching it, you're actually mm -hmm. uh, co-teaching and allowing people to come into the academy to say, I am validating this way of working and expressing and uh, contributing to a larger conversation. And then the books that you are um, you know, creating and writing um, are also expanding the academy in a way that sometimes uh, feels uh, uncomfortable, you know, <laughs> it's stretching in a way when it wants to go up, it's going horizontal in a way, or it's reaching back to that generation and enabling it to have a voice mm -hmm. in the academy, which oftentimes it's like sit down and learn, you know <laughs> what I mean? Um, That's right. Uh, so I think this is a great time if uh, you have questions of one another, uh, it'd be great for you to, to pose those questions. We also uh, would like to pose to our audience if they have questions to please uh, pop those in the Q&A function and I will, I just love to begin to uh, open this up um, to, um, to questions. Um, or ideas that we may not have touched on. I know this is a very short period of time and you guys were so efficient in your answers that we had to list it out a series of questions. And I think uh, the first question you answered three of them right, <laughs> right away. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, and, uh, but I don't know, I mean, uh, are there questions that you may have of each other or? Um... I was I was gonna say, Valerie, as you're sort of sorting through or someone sorting through the questions, I wanna say that the, the last, another thing that was important to me, and I don't think this would have been as important to Professors Penn and Anthony, because, uh, it's uh, Neil, I, of course I know. I, in fact, I have both of the hip, that's the joint. And, and I'm waiting for the third. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, but but I wanted to say that um, those artists, I'm guessing, have been relatively stable financially. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of artists whose names you know, and whose music you've listened to a lot, who aren't, and definitely aren't. I mean, the stories about Cool Herc, right, needing to raise money, I think it was for kidney surgery or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's a reminder that this is not a, this is not a friendly industry. And so to the extent that we can use our position, that's, a, I wish I could use my position in a way to actually just make you a full professor and you come here because you, you do deserve it. But at the very least, be compensated for your work come in here, be recognized, but also make this something that pays bills. Because I, I think that gets lost in a lot of this until you start to meet these folks. I'm not, I'm not talking about Mad Skills specifically, it's I, because I'm not sure that's even his situation. I just mean, we know that this is kind of how it works. You, you, you have money and then you don't. And if you're not still relevant, nobody's giving you anything, but we all, we all benefited from your contributions to this culture. 
And so as someone in my position who didn't come out of hip hop as a practitioner at all, I'm not a rapper. I mean, I've rapped like in the shower, it's terrible. Um, <laughs> but no, 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 but like what I do have is a place where I can add a little bit to that. And I do think that if you teach hip hop, rap music, whatever, that you do have that somewhat as an obligation to make sure that you are, you know, we're making a living off of, off of it to some extent. And we just want to make sure that where we can, we can, we can help, uh, help, help the people that made this possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. You think about so many of these uh, institutions, the number of non-academics, you know, poets, visual artists, filmmakers, you know, painters, um, musicians, right, who, who get to lead, you know, quality lives in teaching and learning um, and still pursuing their art, you know, you know, with the support of the university. Um, we have not taken care of hip hop artists, right, and, and figures in that same way. Um, there's no reason why Jamel Shabazz, for instance, you know, shouldn't have a distinguished professorship someplace teaching photography, right, right. in relationship to hip hop. It's just one example of that. Right, you know? right. Absolutely. Uh, the question that came in was um, of other uh, programs such as this across the country. Um, I'm sure you have colleagues in the field uh, who are doing similar things. Uh, do you want to share uh, some of those projects or programs? Well, so for example, at University of Arizona, there is a position in hip hop studies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's really, that is really important, right? It, it involves a different type of institutional, institutional possibility, mm -hmm. right? That the material is taken seriously in a very different way. But I think mm -hmm. these sorts of courses are being taught in a variety of locations now. Right. Joseph Surratt at Columbia is doing mm -hmm. this sort of work, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there are a lot of folks who are, who are doing this. Cornell has an archive. Uh, Harvard has an archive. University of Houston has an archive. Yes, exactly. I, I think about the work of, of my colleague, Treva Lindsay, um, who teaches hip hop and feminism at, at Ohio State and, and who was the very first, one of the first two TAs uh, that Ninth and I used um, in our hip hop course back in 2010. Are you serious? Um, <laughs> I had no idea about that connection. Yes, okay. uh, Treva, Treva was my guy. I was on her dissertation committee, um, okay. and 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 I'm not saying that we had anything to do with her <laughs> teaching a class on hip hop and feminism, um, but there's so many different iterations of it, right? Which is why it's so surprising when we get the type of pushback that we get, right? Because it clearly is already a part of the curriculum, right? The, we're at the stage now, you know, thinking about when Anthony. And I I first got started. And so much about our work was validating why it was important to teach the work, right? We're well beyond those conversations. Yeah. yeah. I, I wish we were further. I would just say that I needed, I needed both of you. I actually, before we came on here today, went to my Google Drive and found the folder that I created with all the documents and letters that I was using to justify this. No, seriously. Yeah. And, the, and, and, and two of them, two of the 10 of them, one was yours with Bun B, one was yours with Ninth Wonder, just to say, hey, I'm not crazy. Right. And let's be honest, if this were Brad Pitt and he didn't have a college degree and he wanted to go to the School of Theater, do you really believe there would be any right. resistance? I mean, I mean right. please. I, I have a, a recent grad student, Dr. Tyler Bunsey, uh, who TA'd oh. for us for, for, for three years. Um, and had to fight to be able to teach a course as a grad student at UNC on hip hop. Um, with but of rap, course, on Rhapsody, right? On, on Rhapsody. Yes. Right? <laughs> right. Who, you know, who visited the class on multiple occasions, um, but yet, you know, very easily was hired at Johnson C. Smith um, as a white professor at an HBCU because they recognized the value right. of his, his expertise in terms of hip hop. Wow. Well, and, and it's so interesting because there are so many layers that hip hop offers entree to, right? I mean, there's literature, there's uh, religion, theology, uh, uh, ideas and uh, applications. Sociology. There's sociology, yes. ethnomusicology uh, without definitely. a doubt. I mean, some of the most brilliant minds who know music uh, more than anyone else. But hip hop is changing. It is a very dynamic form and I'm mm -hmm. curious you know, how are you, I mean, 
working with Bombi, Ninth Wonder, Mad Skills, these are artists who emerged in the 90s, right? And, you know, in sort of the aftermath, where, you know, where do you position hip hop today within this kind of discourse? <laughs> You're calling us old. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. No, no, I'm the young one in this and I'm 45. I think I'm the oldest one on this Zoom right now. So I <laughs> leave that alone. <laughs> I don't have a good answer for you. I mean, I, I and I'll make it quick because I actually would prefer to hear what these guys have to say. Uh, to see that it is, it's an adaptable forum. People have declared hip hop is dead for a long time and they've been wrong. Um, and they've been wrong for a lot of different reasons. I, mean, I think one of the reasons now is that you don't need the same channels of distribution. You right. don't need a radio station. You don't need a record contract. Right. You don't need any of that. You, you can do it off merch, you know, and, right. and touring and your social media presence. And I believe that has opened up the potential for a flowering of creative expression. Now, will that stay? I don't know. But I have seen, I think 2012, 2013 gave us uh, a moment where we could start to envision it that way. And so I, I, I just take the lead from the artists themselves. I don't really have a good, but they have been able to adapt to changing circumstances. And that is kind of what hip hop is really good at. At the same time, it insinuates itself into popular culture everywhere. Every kind of music, toilet paper commercials, you name it, uh, our lexicon. Um, that's why I think it's probably here to stay. I'm, I'm not sure that answered your question, but I want, I, I want to hear what the, the, the people who know it better than I do have to say. You know, I, I would say that it's most interesting to me intellectually in the classroom when it pivots on other modes of inquiry. Right, whether it be visual studies, um, you know, I've taught in the class in the past a, a, a seminar class querying hip hop. Um, you know, I, I did a class called uh, Hip Hop in the House of Hall, um, which was really about looking through hip hop studies through the lens of Stuart Hall, um, hence, hence the Hall. Um, I found it more interesting in that way because you know, the, you know, the, st the students' interest is, is interesting, right? Because when I first started doing this they were all into hip hop culture as an object of study, right? Because they saw hip hop as something that was distinct, you know, from what they heard on the radio and they saw on television. Hip hop is now just another form of pop music to them, right? And, and they're less interested, right? In these kind of historical questions about what hip hop is. Um, and, you know, just as if, you know, if we any of us were teaching a survey in jazz music, we, we wouldn't spend 15 weeks talking about Kenny G or, or any jazz album. You know, I love Jason Moran, but we wouldn't spend 15 weeks talking about Jason Moran's last two albums, right? It would be a longer historical survey. Um, and I think the, the the value of hip hop studies remains in that form. Right. The challenge is to, is to get students right to see it that way, because this is the thing about students in hip hop these days. They all come to hip hop in this kind of DIY format. Right. They love take taking, you know, knife wonder classes because they want to make beats. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so they come to class, you know, with, with their hard drives. Like, can I download your hard drive to get some of it? And, and so it's very different. And knife does this great lecture where he talks about hip hop is one of these things where everybody thinks they can do it. If you're a fan of pro football you're never sitting in the in the stadium thinking i can go down there and do that better right we all up that way and that's a question about how do we teach what we think of as standards evaluation of what's a good criteria for what's good and what's not when very often the students only think about that in terms of the literally instagram followers right and, and, and the number of downloads you know on some streaming service right yeah, so teaching is one aspect of what we do on these campuses, right? And so if the concern is, is to transform mm -hmm. these locations of higher learning, for me, in part, the question is also, what do we do with hip hop outside of the classroom, right? And there's only so much I can do, but my centers have a little bit of cash and I can make that available to folks. So, right, so, so in, in part for me, the question has been, to ask the students, to ask the larger Houston community, what can we do to do this better? 
And in part that has involved what we've gotten back has involved help us preserve this. Mm -hmm. and, and so for us, that was, the, that was the motivation behind the archive to maintain this and to maintain it in a way that makes it viable, period. Mm -hmm. and, and not to compete with University of Houston on this, but mm -hmm. to partner, right? So we developed, we developed a partnership and we sat and we discussed it. Right, if you, and we came up with a procedure. If someone approaches you from these areas of Houston, send them my way. <laughs> if someone approaches you, us from these areas of Houston, we're gonna send them your way. But we will constantly be in conversation. And to ask the students, what else makes sense mm -hmm. to let this live? Mm -hmm. uh, how else we, might we do this in a way that keeps this vibrant? And to make certain that they have resource available to do that and that they have folks with some institutional pull mm -hmm. having their back. Right. Mm -hmm. So just for context, you have Pimp C and who else uh, at Rice? Is oh, it no, he doesn't have Pimp C anymore. I mean, Pimp C, <laughs> RIP. That, 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 no, that we, would, in the that archival would be pretty, collection, we have uh, Pimp C, uh, we, have, <laughs> we have Paul Wall. I mean, we have, a, uh -huh. we have we have Swisher House. Right, so right. We do programming around the archival collections as well to right. bring folks in. And again, we, with, with the Swisher House materials, I sit down with them and say, what makes sense? What, what do you want Rice to do? Right. How should we do this? Right. right. But yeah, I mean, there's, and, and so the, the, the archive is, is, is housed in the, in the Fondren Library but it's it's managed by the Center for Engaged Research and Collaborative Learning. And we have a member of this center who is our community liaison, who does a lot of the vouching for us. Right. right? Who puts us in touch with folks to make certain, again, that these materials are handled in a way that is respectful right. and that gives them the kind of protection and visibility they merit. But the students at this point are, are determined. I'm 57 years old. <laughs> I, I will claim this. And, and there's only so much I can do. And, and so I put it on the students, right? Th if this is a value to you, you right. see the importance, right. you help us make this live. I, I would just add that I think we as scholars, to the extent that we are engaged in this work and we have these archives, the, uh, uh, the important archives, we, we try to hold those archives accountable. So there are some really great ones. Um, I mean, I, I, I actually haven't been uh, to the one in Houston. Cornell, I think, is doing a pretty good job with theirs. Mm -hmm. If you talk to the Harvard one, it's hard to get an email response back. It's, um, it's disappointing sometimes the way that these uh, archives are administered. And so I do think that having an archive shouldn't be checking a box. It has to be about making a place publicly accessible. Yes. And unfortunately, I don't think that's happening across the board. I know that sounds like I'm being, we were supposed to have a happy moment here. And I, but I am, I am, I am having, a, because most places are, but I think if you're gonna archive stuff, you have to make, your, your responsibility is to make it accessible, not to just say you have one. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, it is uh, 7.29 uh, by my clock. And, um, and so I, I, um, I appreciate your voices. And I think what you're doing is um, very important in terms of transforming the academy. Um, there are a lot of state spaces and uh, creating that space of dynamism within the, the, the sort of hollowed walls of the academy is so important in terms of just preparing people um, to, to open themselves up for different uh, modes of expression and ways in which information is shared, uh, knowledge is shared, and it's validating uh, those spaces. And I love the idea of also compensating um, the makers of, of this expression as well. So. Um, just with that, I'd just like to, to part with a, a heartfelt thank you. Um, and um, 
I'm, I'm really just delighted that you were here to kick this off. We could go on, uh, but I think this is a, this is a good place to, to end. Um, the Dirty South was brilliant. Absolutely. Yeah. It was brilliant. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Valerie, and thank you, Professors Nielsen, uh, Neil, and Pin, for your time this evening. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a nice night. You too. And Charlie thank Braxton you. knows more than everybody. Bye. <laughs> thank Bye. you so much. Thank you so much. Yes.